If you don't think the idea of rebirth is scary, think of having to go through adolescence all over again, all the awkwardness, all the problems of adolescence. We're always glad that we've gotten past them. But when we come to meditate, we have to realize, as a meditator, you have to go through adolescence all over again. You start out and you're given a set of rules to follow. It's like being a child. Don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. And for a while they work. But then there comes a time when, if you're going to make the meditation your own, you've got to test the rules. That's adolescence, which is why it's difficult, because sometimes the rules are good rules. And other times there are rules that are meant for you as a child. And sometimes the problem is that you had a childish understanding of the rules, and as you grow up you've got to change that understanding. So you've got to sort that all out. And so no wonder it's an awkward time. And the same goes with meditation. Come to you're told to focus on the breath. And in the beginning you're often told, don't meddle with the breath, just let it come in and go out at its own rate. And you get the basic idea that the less you interfere in the present moment, the better. The more passive you become, the better. But then that makes it difficult for the meditation to be integrated with your life. You're going to go through life totally passive in every situation. That doesn't work. So you've got to test the rule to see whether it's the kind of rule that says, before you cross the road, hold on to somebody's hand. Or that's the type of rule that says, before you cross the road, look to your right. Excuse me, look to your left. <laughs> Thinking about Thailand. Check the oncoming traffic first. The hold in somebody's hand, that's a rule specifically for child children when you grow up. You don't need to follow it anymore. But the rule about looking to your left, that's, that's a good rule to follow, whether you're a child or an adult. And so the rule about not meddling with your breath, which kind of rule is that? It's the holding the hand kind of rule. Because it's usually thought among meditation teachers that when someone's brand new to meditation, they'll probably mess up their breath if they try to control it too much. And so in order to avoid that, that they tell you not to get involved, to be as passive as possible. But as you get more experience with the breath, okay, you don't need to hold on to the teacher's hand anymore. You actually have to experiment with the breath, because otherwise you'll never get a sense of how much subconscious molding of the breath is still going on down to the surface of your consciousness. You'll never get a sense of what input you're putting into the present moment, because that's what it's all about, is seeing that input clearly, because that's the input. Once you see it, then you're going to try to refine it. So you have to go through that awkward stage of messing with the breath too much, messing with your making it too long, making it too short, using too much pressure to change the breath, to fit it into what you think might be a good mold. Or when you find something good, you tend to hold on to it even past the time when it's really worth holding on to. Or forcing the breath into different parts of the body where it's best not to force it. These are things you have to learn from experience. You have to go through the adolescence of your meditation. So you begin to get a sense of what's just right. And that's where you begin to get a sense of finesse in your meditation. But to gain that sense of finesse, that sense of just right, you have to go through the wrong stages, doing it wrong, learning how to recognize it for wrong. And because of the awkwardness in that, we tend to avoid it. But there's no way you're going to get out of your childhood as a meditator and into your adulthood unless you go through this stage. So when you work with the breath, keep two things in mind. One is that you're going to experiment with the breath to see what feels good right now. And then you also have to look at the way you're experimenting. So you're watching both the breath and the mind as it's dealing with the breath. And there are no hard and fast rules about this, but you try to feel your way. 
this is why the path is a gradual path. The Buddha once compared the path of practice to the continental shelf off of India. There's a gradual slope and then there's a sudden drop. It's like the continental shelf, shelf off the east coast of the United States. And we all look forward to that sudden drop. But as he says, you have to go through the gradual slope first before you're going to get there. Sometimes our approach to meditation is simply hoping for the sudden drop to come, thinking that if we can make ourselves as still and passive in the present moment, that opens the space for grace to drop on us. In other words, waiting for the accident of awakening to happen. But it doesn't happen that way. The drop comes through the gradual slope. In other words, as you get more and more sensitive to what you're doing in the present moment, you get more and more refined. Your input into the present moment gets more refined. And finally you get to the point where you really can stop it. But you have to go through many, many layers first. So the activity of being skillful, the activity of dealing with a breath like this is not a distraction from the sort of awakening that's just waiting to happen to us if we get passive enough. That's not the case. It comes through, the awakening comes through the process of getting more and more sensitive to what you're doing. Doing it with more and more refinement. So this focus on being skillful is, an, is a pr preparation. It, it's what gets us to that, the sudden drop of awakening. Otherwise, how are you going to develop your sensitivity? And if you don't develop your sensitivity, where are you going to get the discernment that leads to awakening? It has to come through this process of being willing to make mistakes, of being patient with the gradual process. We're an impatient nation. We want things to happen right away. We look at the past and we say, oh, those people didn't know anything. They had to go through this long, involved process because they didn't understand the quick way to get things done. And yet so often the, the quick way to get things done okay, can get, gets quick results, but they may not be lasting results. They might not be good over the long term. And meditation is one of those areas where time is required. You're getting to know the breath, and as the Buddha said, with any kind of friendship, it takes time. You have to be observant and be willing to put in a fair amount of time to gain a sense of familiarity. Think of yourself of becoming friends with the breath. And as in any friendship, there's got to be a give and take. There are going to be awkward moments. But if you stick with it and you have the goodwill needed to underline the friendship and the powers of observation to know when you've made a mistake, to admit your mistakes. The friendship can grow. And that's when your friend can start revealing all of his or her secrets. There's lots of interesting things to find out in this energy flow of the breathing. You can start seeing how the breath affects your feelings exactly which experience is, the, is a breath experience and which experience is a feeling experience, feeling the pleasure or pain. If you really look at it, you begin to see that you, you've often drawn the line at the wrong spot. The actual movement of the energy is form. The sense of pleasure or pain that goes along with it which can, be off, can be extremely fleeting. That's the feeling. When you see how fleeting feelings are, then that rearranges your, your notion about how much of your life you've spent chasing after pleasant feelings, and you know, only to see more and more clearly how fleeting they are. So as you really look into this process of breathing, there's, there's an awful lot to see if you're willing to stick with that gradual slope. you find along the way that there are sudden insights. But for a lot of the practice, it's this, overlong, it's this overall slope. But there's always something to do. If you're sitting around waiting for awakening to happen, it gets, it gets pretty desensitizing after a while. 
putting yourself into a dull mood, just saying, well, just wait here long enough and maybe it'll come. And what you find in the end, end result is that you're actually desensitizing yourself to a lot of the stuff that's going on in the mind. You try to hide it from yourself, hoping that if I hide it well enough, then the enlightenment will be fooled and it will come. But as you're working with the breath, each breath coming in, noticing what kinds of feelings it gives rise to, what you can do to make it a more pleasurable breath. One, it gives you something to do as you're waiting for awakening to happen, and you're just not sitting around waiting idly. You're actually engaged in a process <coughs> that makes you more sensitive. And the sensitivity is the discernment here. We often think of discernment as trying to clone our minds into seeing things the way the Buddha tells us to see them. Well, he tells us to look for the inconstancy and the stressfulness and things. And that's, that's a question of developing sensitivity. Can you sense really refined levels of inconstancy? Can you, can you sense really refined levels of stress? This is what the meditation is designed to do. Then as you discover those more and more refined levels and take them apart to create a greater sense of stability, a greater sense of well-being in the mind, you finally get to the mind at that point of equilibrium where everything opens up. You fall into what they call the stream. There comes a point where there is no input into the present moment, and you know for sure because you thoroughly sensitize yourself to every kind of input the mind has had, every little discussion it has, every little agreement it has with itself, even the sublingu sublinguistic communication that's going on in the mind. You can become more and more sensitive to that. Finally, you get to a point where that stops, and there's a strong sense that you no longer do anything, and this is where the path takes over. The path actually does the work from that point on, opens you up to the deathless. So it is, there is that sense of stream. It pulls you along without you having to do anything at all. But to get to that point, you've got to do a lot of doing. Be very sensitive in what you're doing. So you can reach that level of refinement where you finally get to that point of equilibrium, where you don't have to put anything more in. So this little exercise here of adjusting the breath, evaluating the breath, that's the beginning of discernment. That's the beginning of insight into the three characteristics of inconstancy, stress, not self. And so it's crucial in the practice. It's the point where you're not just obeying the, the rules for children, but you're actually getting a sense of how the rules really work, which ones apply to you as a mature meditator. So even though it may be awkward going through this kind of adolescence of testing things and finding you made a mistake, well, nobody else has to know about your mistakes. Then you actually learn from them. So even though it may be awkward in it, still there's a lot that's learned. That's what's important. <laughs>